So as Jenny said, um, I am the new uh, extension agronomist for University of Maryland. I'm telling everyone, you got like two more weeks to call me the new Bob Craddeville, and then after that, you got to learn my name. All right. <laughs> so I will accept the new Bob Craddeville for a couple more weeks till we get through agronomy meeting season. Um, so um, I'm excited to be here today. I, I started July 1, and overwhelmingly, kind of the number one thing I've been hearing as I've been, you know, out and about, I mean, honestly, even before I started preparing for the winter meeting season, you know, the concerns that I was, was hearing was, we need to do something, we need to think about our nitrogen recommendations, all right? So I want to say, I heard you, we're thinking about it, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today, all right? So not a lot of data today. Today is more of a bit of a philosophical talk. So I ask you for the next however long I have, 50 minutes. Open your mind. Think a little bit differently with me about nitrogen management. All right, I'm going to kind of set the stage for some of the work that I, I hope to start doing here as I you know, move into my, the beginning of my career. All right, maybe some of this is review. Maybe some of you all are doing this. I hope everyone at least learns one new thing today while I'm talking. Um, so keep your minds open and let's think a little bit differently um, and, and think about nitrogen management kind of moving forward, all right? Using two, 2018, which was, you know, a pretty depressing year for some, but I think it actually provides us a great opportunity to think a little bit differently about our nitrogen management, all right? So let's get started. We've got to do the typical review, right? We've, we've got to go over nitrogen cycle. We've got to understand how it works before we can understand and think about moving forward, all right? So um, IPNI gave us a really beautiful kind of updated version of our nitrogen cycle. I don't know, I think you guys who have seen me talk before, you've probably seen my phosphorus cycle with the squares and the rectangles. And while it was basic, I don't know, I think I kind of like that one better. This one looks a little busy, so let's just zoom in and let's focus in on what exactly we want to talk about. All right, so first I want to look at what are the different sources of nitrogen in the soil? How does nitrogen exist in the soil in those different forms? All right, so we've got our three different forms, first being our organic nitrogen, nitrogen that comes from your manure, nitrogen that comes from plant residues. All right, then we've got our two plant available forms, our positively charged ammonium and our negatively charged nitrate, okay? And what's really important and what I want you guys to see about this slide is notice that there is not an arrow going from that organic end over to our plant, all right? This organic source, while it is a good source of nitrogen to be in the soil, it is not immediately plant available, okay? Unlike our ammonium and our nitrate. So we get our ammonium and our nitrate by our wonderful, awesome soil bacteria, living bacteria in the soil that transform, that change the form of that organic nitrogen into those plant available forms, okay? This is really important to understand. And when we have these plant available forms, they're great, they're available to the plant, but they don't stick around in the soil for a very long time, okay? The soil does not have a high affinity to hang on to nitrogen, all right? So if you kind of want to hold on your nitrogen a little bit longer in the soil, it's got to be put down in that um, organic form. And I think a lot of folks do take advantage of this, right? Putting out manure beginning of the season, hoping it's going to be there throughout the season, because hopefully you've treated your bacteria well, all right, in your soil. But what happens if those conditions aren't ideal for those bacteria? They're, they're living things just like us, right? What if it gets too hot? What if it gets too cold? What if it gets too wet? Like last year, what if it gets too dry? All right, we're gonna decrease the activity of those bacteria, they're not gonna function, all right? We are not going to have that transformation from that organic nitrogen source, so we're not going to have our plant available forms of nitrate, all right? So we may be left with plenty of organic again, but none of it's gonna get into our plant because our bacteria are not functioning, all right? So this is why we don't really recommend this idea of putting all your nitrogen down, maybe in an organic form, and just hoping that your bacteria are going to get you through the season, okay? All right, so those are our different sources. Let's talk about some of the ways that nitrogen can be lost from the soil. There's a, there's a couple different ways, all right? Again, this is a very busy image, but we're going to zoom in and we're going to focus in on, on what's really important here, all right? 
So we've got our two plant available forms. Remember, our positively charged ammonium and our negatively charged nitrate. Those charges are important, okay? So let's look at what happens. If we've got ammonium in our soil and our pH increases, all right, we're lessening our concentration of those hydrogen ions. So one of those hydrogens gets ripped right off that ammonium, turns into ammonia, and it's going to volatilize, gone, right to the atmosphere. Is gone. All right? Let's take a look at that nitrate. Oftentimes, when we talk about nitrogen, we say, well, if there's water that's moving through the profile, it's probably going to pull that nitrogen and take it right with it. All right? So that's exactly what happens. Our negatively charged nitrate, if there's water moving through the profile, is going to leach right out, gone. All right? Also, if we've got anaerobic conditions, low oxygen, soil is saturated, wet and saturated for a prolonged period of time, same thing with the ammonia volatilization. Those oxygens ripped right off that nitrate and we lose our N2 gas gone right to the atmosphere. All right? And this is important. This is where that charge is important. All right? Our soil has a negative charge to it. So it will tend to hold on little better to that positively charged ammonium, all right? But the negative charge on the nitrate and the negative charge in the soil repel each other. And that's why that nitrate, if any water moves to that profile, it's gone, all right? That looks pretty grim, actually. I will say I always felt bad for those grad students that studied nitrogen, because they would put it out there, and then they'd try to go find it, and it was never where they put it. And I was over there studying phosphorus, and it was always there, because it really didn't move too much. Um, as I am searching for grad students to make them study nitrogen, so I feel very bad for that, what I'm about to make them do. All right? Um, and it was those grad students that were trying to find that nitrogen, oftentimes because they were studying some of these products, right? Some of these nitrogen stabilizer products. So we do have some options available to help a little bit, all right? And, and I'm being a little squirrely about this on, on purpose because, you know, these products are not meant to be, you know, yield makers. These are like, well, I'm anticipating that there might be some poor conditions and there's this product available that can help keep that nitrogen in the soil for a little bit longer, all right? So, so how do they function? We, we try to avoid that volatilization, remember, that ripping off of that hydrogen, we try to avoid that by inhibiting the action of urease, which is the enzyme that makes this happen. All right, the enzyme that rips that hydrogen off. So try to keep that hydrogen on our positively charged ammonium to hold it in that soil for just a little bit longer. All right. We try to avoid leaching and denitrification. Again, keep that nitrogen in that positively charged form. Try to prevent the transformation between the positively charged ammonium to that negatively charged nitrate. Again, keeping the nitrogen in that positive form so it can be held slightly a little bit longer in that soil. And then we have some of those combination products that do both, all right? Again, difficult to predict when you might need to use these products. Okay. So hopefully y'all are with me so far. Hopefully that was review for everyone. And you're like, all right, Nicole, I got it. I got it, sources, losses, my products that can kind of help out a little bit, all right? We know these things. These are kind of the basic things that we know. And so from this information about sources and losses of nitrogen, we've developed the four R's, right? Mark kind of talked about it a little bit, similar four R's when we're talking about weed management, right? The four R's, right rate, right place, right source at the right time, all right? So let's talk a little bit about that in corn. What do we know? How have we developed these based on what we know about nitrogen? All right, so let's start with the right rate. We're going to come back to this. this. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. But right now, when we talk about the right rate for nitrogen, it's based on your historic yield goal for that field. How much corn are you anticipating to yield? You put about one pound of nitrogen per bushel of expected yield. All right, 150 to 200 pounds, kind of standard for here in Maryland. All right, so we consider this our right rate. Right time, all right? We're going to look at some slides here coming up. But in general, when we say, what is the right time to apply nitrogen, we want to make sure that we're pairing our nitrogen application with when the plant is going to need it. 
Why? We just talked about all those different ways that nitrogen is just going to be lost from your soil. All right? We can't plan to store that nitrogen long term in the soil. We got to put it out there, make sure we get it to the plant when it's going to need it most. So what does that look like for our practices in the field? 20 to 40 percent nitrogen up front and then come back and side dress at V6 later. When that plant needs another shot of nitrogen, come back out and put it out for them. All right? And then right place. Again, we just talked about all those different ways that nitrogen can be lost from the soil. We want to get that nitrogen down in the soil where it's going to bump into that plant root and be taken up by that plant. Okay, so put it in the soil so it doesn't volatilize. And if you really want to use some of those products, go ahead and use them to kind of keep that nitrogen in the soil for a little bit longer. All right. Now, you guys are like, all right, Nicole, we know this. This is pretty standard practice. That all sounds pretty good based on what you said. But in the field, especially in a year when we have really extreme weather like we did, that all becomes very difficult, right? Sounds good in theory, but it can be very difficult to actually take that theory and put it into practice. All right? All right, so I talked about pairing our nitrogen with when the plant needs it most. All right, I will say I made one of these slides for every single county. I think I got invited to every single county meeting this year, so it's been really fun um, taking a look back on the precipitation that we had this past year for our individual counties, all right, individual regions that I've gone to. All right, so let's take a look at, at what this means for the corn plant. So on the bottom here, we're just going throughout the growing season here, all right, and this is uptake of nitrogen, and the different colors represent the different parts of the plant that are using the nitrogen at that point, at that point in time, okay? So what I want to draw your attention to, what I want you guys to focus in on in this slide, all right? Look at this area right here at towards the end of kind of vegetative growth, all right? What, I, what you should be able to see is that there's a really steep incline there, all right? A really steep increase in that nitrogen uptake over a very short period of time, all right? Rapid growth happening right here. Plant needs a lot of nitrogen. All right. All right, let's take a look at what that looked like this past year. And I'm going to put up, this is daily precipitation data. So I went to one of the rain gauges, and I pulled up every day that there was a rain event, and I plotted it along here. All right. So here's where our rapid growth is, all right, right in through here. And look at all these opportunities, look at all these days where if you put all your nitrogen out up front, look at all those opportunities that that nitrogen could have been lost, all right? Again, this is why we do not recommend putting that nitrogen out up front and just hoping and praying it's going to be there by the time the plant needs it later, hoping and relying on those bacteria, all right? Because I was probably pretty wet last year for those bacteria to try to function, all right? Okay, so last year was really bad. I, now I'm being recorded. This is the first one that I've been recorded, so maybe I should be a little careful about what I say about MDA, all right? But so last year it was really bad. MDA said, all right, I think we need to do something about this. You know, it's really bad. We've gotten a lot of precipitation and everyone's really concerned. So June 14th, MDA came out with some exemptions and some exceptions. All right, and I say this mostly because I, I know that I have a captive audience here because you all have to sit and listen to me so I can make this point, okay? So on June 14th last year, MDA said, if you put all your nitrogen out up front, you can come back and put 25% of what your plan said, you can come, out, come back and put more nitrogen out, all right? So while I have you all here listening to me, the point that I want to make in bold capital letters this is not our university's recommendation. If you go back to SFM1, which is the guidance document that outlines what the university's recommendations are, it assumes that you are split applying your nitrogen. There is no recommendation to put all your nitrogen out up front. Okay, I just want to make that clear while everyone is forced to hear me say that. All right. All right, so if you we're planning to side dress. You put some of your nitrogen out up front, and you were planning to come back and side dress, and you didn't do it before June 14th last year. You could bump up the rate of what you were planning on side dressing. All right? And 
If you had already side dressed, so you put your, your nitrogen out up front, you came back and you already side dressed before June 14th, you still were able to go back out again and put, up, put out up to 25% more of what you had already side dressed. Okay, so if you actually listen to me before I even started and you have an open mind and you've been sitting here thinking, I'm thinking about nitrogen a little bit differently, Nicole, and you told me we're gonna have to manage my, our nitrogen differently, but last year, MDA just said we could do whatever we want because we got a lot of rain, all right? So maybe I don't have to listen to you, Nicole. Maybe I can just sit back and hope we get another year with a lot of rain, and MDA is just going to let us come out and put more nitrogen down, all right? Now, no one, I haven't talked to anyone at MDA about this, but Nicole's opinion is this probably isn't going to happen again, all right? Last year was the jumping off point. We all need to start thinking differently about managing our nitrogen. And then I do want to mention the exemptions because we're talking about it. If you use some type of organic manure, other organic source of nitrogen, the recommendation was to do your PSNT, pre side dress nitrate test, and follow what the um, application was based on your results. We're going to talk a little bit about this PSNT test in a minute. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to get a little philosophical for a minute here. All right? I want to back up and I want to break down what we're talking about. As so we're talking about nitrogen management, and specifically when we're talking about what are the recommendations, okay? What are the university recommendations on how we manage our nitrogen? Let's look at those words, okay? So when I think about the nitrogen management process, I really like this visual from Doug Beagle up at Penn State, all right? It's an upside down pyramid. We're starting really broad at the top, and then we're honing in, we're zooming in, okay? So our university's recommendation of that right rate Right? One pound of nitrogen per bushel of expected yield is the top of that pyramid. All right? We are starting really broad. We are getting you in the ballpark of how much nitrogen you might need. If you're going to purchase nitrogen, you need to have an idea of how much you might need. All right? You can use this recommendation to kind of get you there, how much you might need across all of your fields. Very crude. It's an educated guess, but it's fairly crude, and it's going to get you in the ballpark. All right? But then you sit down with your nutrient management advisor, hopefully the person in extension who writes your plan, or maybe you've got a private um, person, or maybe you write your own plan, right? And you start kind of zooming in and honing in on that recommendation, all right? We make adjustments. Do we have any nitrogen credits from manure or legume crops that we planted? Are you using PSNT that we mentioned, maybe chlorophyll meter to actually try and see what's going on in the field, all right? But we go a little bit further and we hone in our recommendations. We make these adjustments, all right, based on collecting more data. Okay? Then we go even further, all right? We look at how did you apply that nitrogen? Source, method, all right? Timing, going back to those four R's. Okay, and again, we zoom in a little bit further and come into, all right, this is how much nitrogen we're going to need. But you'll notice that hasn't really gotten us to the bottom of this pyramid. And, and what I really think is we are missing this last very crucial and important piece of our nitrogen management process, all right? And that is taking into account the experience of the farmers, all right? You all know in your head the wonky spots in your field that are never going to produce well, right? That weird little wet spot that you're just not going to get good yield no matter what you throw out there, okay? You know that. Maybe you also know some spots in your field that you wish you could do more on, all right? Maybe you're limited on what you can apply in that area of that field, and you think you could really push those yields up, all right? And you know that in your head, running through the field, seeing the yields pop up on your, in your combine, or you just know because this is your field and you've been farming it for a long time, all right? But what's really important is we've got to take that information and that experience that's in your head, and we somehow need to turn that into a data point, okay? The only way we can change and make different decisions with our nitrogen management is to have this information exist as a data point. Okay? And, and that's where I think we need to move forward. And we're going to talk about some of these tools. We're going to talk about corn stalk nitrate test at the end. All right? And, and my point is, I think that folks are already doing this. 
all right? See this little feedback loop? You're taking your experience. You know that wet, weird spot in your field. It's not worth putting any nitrogen out there because it's just going to get wet, and whatever you plant there isn't going to do well, all right? We're already kind of doing this informally, maybe. But I think we need to have a process set in place that we can more formally do this, and the only way we're going to be able to do this is by collecting some data. All right. Off my soapbox now, all right? Maybe I've convinced you to take a different approach to your nitrogen management this year. You're like, Nicole, I'm with you so far, but I think what you're telling me to do is going to create a lot more work for me, right? <laughs> Isn't that the story of anything that comes out of extension, right? We're trying to tell you to do good stuff, but it usually ends up meaning it's going to be more work for you, all right? So stick with me. If you're still on board, let me get through this. All right, yes, I'm going to have you consider and ponder some more points, but spoiler alert, there are tools out there to kind of help you make some of these decisions. All right, so let's go through a couple things you can consider as you're making your different nitrogen management decisions through the season. All right, so number one, okay, you're all excited. I'm going to manage my nitrogen a little bit differently. I didn't put it all out up front. I'm going to come back and side dress. And oh, I went out and I looked at my field and I see a nitrogen deficiency. Oh goody, time for action. All right, like Mark said, get out, you look in the field, yay, we got to do something now. All right, make sure the nitrogen deficiency you are seeing is actually a deficiency in the sense that there is not enough nitrogen there. Or are the plants so stressed out, are those roots gray, swollen, and mushy, as they are apparently in this picture? and not able to take up any more nitrogen? Is your plant dying because the roots are stressed out, or is the issue actually that there's not enough nitrogen there? Okay, so putting out nitrogen in a situation where your roots look like that, not gonna solve the problem, all right? So again, not wasting your time. We have to actually diagnose what the issue is. Here's a picture from Richard Taylor. Perfect nitrogen deficiency. Look at it, you'd go, yep, nitrogen deficiency but it's because it's been flooded, wet, and those roots are not taking up nitrogen, all right? Not necessary to apply nitrogen to this because we've diagnosed the problem as crop stress, all right? All right, soybeans, right? We had kind of already talked about this. Soybeans, we don't fertilize, we don't always fertilize with nitrogen because they've got those bacteria that come in and infect their roots and pull that nitrogen out of the atmosphere and feed it to the plant. Right, but just like we talked about, those bacteria that transform that organic nitrogen to our plant available nitrogen, they're living bacteria. Too wet, too dry, too hot, too cold, the bacteria that infect the roots of the soybeans are not going to function, okay? So put some nitrogen out on this, I don't know, maybe just wait till the field dries up a little bit and like, get those bacteria come back to life, okay? So identifying what the actual problem is. Okay, replant. I know that this is not nitrogen related, but again, I have a captive audience, so you're gonna be forced to listen to what I've gotta say, all right? So, <laughs> replant. I point this out because last year, driving around, oh goodness, I saw some fields replanted like two and three times, okay? And, and I'm driving around, I am, I am a student of John Hall now, so I have been thinking about business and numbers and economics, and I drive past these fields thinking, how is it economic to come back and replant two, three times that same field, all right? So I'm here to share with you that I found a really awesome resource developed by Bob Nielsen out at Purdue, all right? He put together a rather lengthy worksheet that is available to help guide replant decisions, all right? Removing the emotion from that decision. It can be a very emotional decision, all right? Man, I'm supposed to plant corn in this field and I really should replant it, all right? But I think we need to step away from the emotion, again, using data to make good decisions, okay? So while this can be a lengthy process, I think this is like a 14, 16 page worksheet. I went through the whole thing. Um, it's very lengthy and it requires a lot of, you need to have good data of your own to even be able to complete this worksheet, okay? But if you have the data and you have the time, I think it's worth it to use a resource like this to guide your decisions. 
All right, and according to Bob, you know, a lot of times these replanting decisions are not economic. So if you're having trouble making that decision, have no fear. There are tools available to help you, okay? All right, let's go back to nitrogen because that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. All right, is your credited nitrogen really gone? You're like, well, you know, I went through, we did our nutrient management plan. You know, Casey told me I got nice nitrogen out there, but I, I think it's gone and I really want to put out some more nitrogen. All right, if this isn't something that they've heard in the extension office, I'm sure they have, all right? So again, can't make these decisions based on emotion. We have to have some data, all right? That's where the PSNT, pre cydrus nitrate test, comes into play, all right? Takes an actual measure of what nitrogen is available, is left over, over and hopefully don't need to um, come back out in cydrus, or if you do, it's gonna give you a good recommendation. Um, what was interesting is last year, there was a lot of variability um, in the PSNT. I forgot to ask Casey before I started to see maybe what she saw here in Queen Anne's County. Um, but I'd say across the region, there was a lot of variability. But this test really is the only way to demonstrate or to give you guidance on, you know, if some of that credited nitrogen is actually gone. All right. All right. Is the soil still saturated? An appropriate question, right? Obviously, if this is what your field looks like, you are probably going to figure out that it's not the time to do a nitrogen application, all right? But maybe the ponding has gone away, all right? And you think, yep, I'm ready to go out. I want to side dress. I want to put down some nitrogen. Just check that soil first, all right? Just make sure that soil is not saturated. Remember, if we've got wet, soggy, saturated conditions, any of that nitrate is going to lose those oxygens and it's just going to go right up into the air. Denitrification, all right? You're wasting your time, you're wasting your money, you're wasting a trip across the field. If that soil is going to be too wet. Give it a couple days and let it dry out. In conjunction with consideration number four is consideration number five. As a recovering soil scientist, okay, this picture hurts my heart, all right? I don't want to see this. Okay, it is not worth it to go out and rut up your fields like this to apply nitrogen. Give it a couple days to dry out, okay? You are gonna have to come back later and spend time and money to fix this problem, all right? You may not even be able to wrap your brain around what, you, what is happening to your soil by compacting it like this, okay? It's gonna do more long-term damage to do this to the soil than to just hold off a couple days on that nitrogen. Okay, so again, other factors to consider when we're managing our nitrogen. Oh, I love being in a county where I can finally show this slide, because as I was over on the western shore, I showed this slide and they all were like, nope, not here. So here, this may actually be an option for you. All right, if you've got irrigation, if you've got the ability to fertigate, um, this may be the best option for you. Put out a little bit of N at the time when the plant needs it most. Okay, back to that recommendation pairing our nitrogen application with when the plant needs it. All right, you can put out a little bit, take a tissue test, come back out again later, okay? So fertigation may be a really um, popular, really good option. Okay, so that was a lot. You're like, Nicole, you just made me consider six more things that I don't really wanna think about because I got enough crap going on this time of year and I just don't need to worry about that. All right, I don't know how I'm gonna go through and make all these decisions because I got too much going on, all right? So here was the spoiler. There are tools that are available to help you with this. And I will go even further to say that there are people available to help you with using these tools, all right? Please see your local extension agents come to the offices and ask them if you need help using these tools, okay? they would probably be extremely happy for you to come in and ask them and they can give you some guidance, okay? So don't be afraid, don't be fearful. I think we need to get in the habit of using these tools so we gotta practice and don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. So what are some of the tools that we can use, all right? The first one I wanna chat about, variable rate nitrogen application. You all may have, I know you all heard Dr. Josh McGrath come and talk about his work with Greenseeker when he was still here at the University of Maryland. All right, so I want to explain a little bit about how it works, all right? The Green Seeker technology basically is what it says it is, right? It seeks, it looks out, it reads the greenness of the plant as you're running through the field, okay? And it uses an algorithm, a mathematical equation to decide 
how much nitrogen should be applied based on the greenness of that plant. All right, so if you're running through the field, green seekers looking at your corn and it says, you know, this corn looks healthy, but it could be a little bit greener. All right, I'm going to give it a little bit of nitrogen. It's side dress time. This corn looks good, but it needs some nitrogen. The algorithm says apply nitrogen. All right, green seekers running across the field and hits a really nice looking patch of corn, super green, looks really good. This corn maybe hit the jackpot of its location. Maybe those bacteria were really turning over that organic end. This corn doesn't need any more nitrogen. The algorithm tells the machine, nope, don't apply any nitrogen. All right. Maybe you're running the green seeker near that wonky spot of your field, right? That low, weird spot that no matter what you do there, you know, that corn's always going to be underwater. It just doesn't look good. Maybe there's something up with your soil in that area. All right. As the green seeker runs across that patch, it's going to say, whoa, this corn is too far gone. I'm not going to waste nitrogen on this part of the field. It's not going to matter. This corn's never going to do well anyway. All right. And so overall, as this machine is running across the field and varying that rate of nitrogen, in general, we found that on average, it actually ends up putting out less nitrogen than if you just went across the field at that flat rate. Okay. Some areas it gives a little more, some areas it gives a little less. Okay. What is my point? My point is not that I want everyone to go out tomorrow and try to buy a green seeker. Okay. That's not what I'm saying. Green seeker is not ready for prime time yet. Okay. But my point is, is that the technology behind the green seeker, the idea that we need to look at what the plant needs, let the plant tell us what it needs, and then we provide it to the plant, all right? That idea, that technological idea, is I think where we need to move forward with our nitrogen management, okay? Not a flat rate across the field. Let's see what the plant needs and have the ability to provide that plant exactly what it says it needs. So, Nobody go buy a green seeker tomorrow, OK? <laughs> All right. Some of the nitrogen management models. You guys may have heard of these. You guys may have folks um, approaching you and asking you to work with some of these nitrogen management models. Examples include in Circa, ADAPT-N, HiQ. Um, I'm just being very clear that I work for the university. I'm not endorsing any of these models. I'm simply just saying their names so that it may trigger, oh yeah, someone came and talked to me about Incirca, okay? Um, I stole these quotes right from their websites, basically just to describe what they do. They're decision support tools to help farmers make less risky decisions, all right? They take into account historical climate in that field, current weather data, current economic data, and basically split, spit you out a recommendation, should you apply nitrogen, should you not apply nitrogen, okay? Now again, this is technology moving forward to help us kind of make better decisions. I think there's promise with this, okay? I will caution you though, is we need to ensure that these nitrogen management models are being verified for our area, all right? What I mean by that is we are not the I states, okay? No one is out there developing new technology just for Maryland, okay? So a lot of these new technologies get developed in states and other regions of the country, and they may not be appropriate for use in our area with our climates and our soils, okay? So I caution you, or I implore you to ask questions. Hey, has this model been verified in our area? Before I invest in this and before I start using it, what have we done to make sure this model works in our area? All right, that's all I'm gonna say. I think once we get these models verified, I think there could potentially be some promise in using them, okay? All right, FSNT, maybe you've stuck with me this whole time now, and you're like, Nicole, this all sounds well and good, but I'm concerned if I manage my nitrogen better on my corn, there's not gonna be anything less for the small grain that I'm planning on planting after that, all right? I have concerns, I'm gonna get so good with my management, and what am I gonna do about those small grains that I plan on putting out after, all right? Again, have no fear, there is a tool available to help you, all right? False soil nitrate test, that's exactly what it was developed for. Fields going from corn to small grains, and you're thinking, wow, well, I really think I need to put some nitrogen down in the fall. All right, what do we need to do? Collect some data to help us make that decision. So 
The FSNT, take a soil sample right after corn harvest. You can either submit it to the lab or you can do a quick test. Jenny, do you guys do FSNTs in the office? Perfect. You can come to the Queen Anne's Extension office and they'll help you do the FSNT. And if you're, the breakoff point is about 10 parts per million. If you're below that, you can apply about 30 pounds per acre of nitrogen. All right, let's look at where this recommendation came from. All right, Bob was gracious enough to share some of this data with me. So let's go through this table. We're going to go through line by line, box by box, and see what this means. All right, we are looking at the probability of a profitable yield response to putting out 30 pounds of nitrogen in the fall, all right, for wheat. Profitable is the key word here. So our cutoff point is this 10 parts per million. So if we're below 10, this is this line, and if we're above 10, these are our numbers, all right? So before we get to profitable yield, let's just look at yield. Are we going to even get a yield response when we put down fall in? Before we even get into the the dollars of it, all right? So this is just how much of the time, what percentage of the time are we actually going to see a yield increase by putting down 30 pounds of fall in, all right? If we're in that low category where it is actually recommended to put down some fall in, only two thirds of the time are we actually seeing a yield response. Forget profitable, just a yield response, all right? And that drops to a little over half of the time when we're above 10 parts per million. Only half the time we're even going to see a yield response. Forget about profitable, okay? All right, let's look at this profitable. Say we're having a really good year. Nitrogen's cheap and wheat prices are high. When we're in that low category, below 10 parts per million, only half the time we're even gonna see a profitable yield response. Only a third of the time when we're over that 10 parts per million, a profitable yield response. And look how bad that gets if we're having a bad year where ends expensive and wheat prices are down. Less than third percent of the time, even when you're low, you're going to get a profitable yield response. Only 10% of the time, if you're above that 10 parts per million cutoff, will you see a profitable yield response. You know what this kind of says to me? It's kind of a crapshoot. But I would say most of the time, you probably don't need that fall nitrogen. Now, that's not saying that we shouldn't reevaluate this when everybody starts getting a little bit better and more efficient at managing their nitrogen on their corn, OK? All right, last point I want to make. How I'm doing OK. All right, uh, corn stock nitrate tests, CSNTs. I've been asking every county that I go to, anybody doing these? Oh, one person. Hey, Marshall. <laughs> All right, that's about the response that I've been getting in every single county. And I can tell you I know absolutely why, because these are the worst sample. You think soil samples are bad to take. Corn stalk nitrate tests are the worst. You've got to walk around on the field, kind of hunched over the whole time, chopping stalks. All right, it's a pain. I understand. However, talking about collecting data to harness that experience in your brain and make a data point and put it down on paper, this is an excellent test for that, all right? CSNTs are really good at determining how good your nitrogen management on your corn was, okay? I say was, we call this the post-mortem test. At this point in the growing season, there is nothing you can do to fix that corn. All right, this is post-mortem. This is simply, this is my data point, and I'm gonna put it in my notebook, and next year I'm gonna come back and look at it again, all right? Nothing you can do to change and impact your corn at this point. You're simply collecting data for next year, all right? But it is an excellent test for determining how good you were, how efficient you were for your nitrogen management. So why do we need this, right? Nicole, duh, I'm going to look at my field and I'm going to see how green it was and that's how I'm going to be able to tell if I was deficient or not, right? I can look out on my field and say, yep, I definitely had spots there where I had a nitrogen deficiency. Yeah, perfect, awesome. You can visually see spots in your field where you were severely deficient, all right? What about the spots in your field that had a slight deficiency, that hidden hunger, all right? Visually, those spots in your field are going to look great. There's no way for you to identify those areas in your field where there was that slight deficiency, that hidden hunger. All right. Last bullet point. It's really impossible for you to visually assess if you had too much nitrogen, right? You're going to look out on that field and go, 
looks great, I'm done. I'm managing my nitrogen well, everything looks nice and green. All right, but the beauty of this test is it can help tell you that you were way over applying that nitrogen and there's a chance that you can cut back, okay? So here is what it looks like to collect those samples. It's an eight inch piece of stalk that is six inches above the ground, all right? We had this similar setup. We had a stick that was taped off and we put it down next to the corn stalk. We actually welded two um, like hedge cutters together with handles so we didn't even have to take two snips. We only had to do one, all right? You're gonna collect these samples, these corn stalks between quarter milk line and three weeks after black layer, way at, towards the end of that season. Cut them into small pieces and send them to the lab, all right? So let's look at what those results look like. 700 to 2,000 parts per million nitrate is considered our optimum range here, all right? That's what it looks like here on this graph. That means you were doing really well, you had good nitrogen management, probably didn't have much deficiency, optimum, all right? What happens if you're above 2,000? You had plenty of nitrogen this season. How do we know that? All right, because that part of the corn stalk is where the plant accumulates nitrogen. All right, nitrogen mobile in that plant gets translocated to those new leaves, right? If all the rest of the leaves, everything else looks healthy, no need for more nitrogen, that part of the stalk is just gonna keep pulling it out of the soil and we're gonna have those excessive concentrations. All right, that's what that means when you're above 2,000, you had enough nitrogen. What about if you were down here below 700, all right? The upper parts of your plants were running out of nitrogen, calling, bringing up the rear from the bottom of that stalk, translocating that nitrogen to other parts of the plant, and we saw lower concentration of nitrogen in that stalk down there. That's what that means when you're below 700. All right, I know the question that everyone's gonna ask me, well, if I was deficient, how deficient was I? Right? How much more nitrogen do I have to apply next year then? All right? And the answer is the answer I always give anyone who asks me a question. It depends, right? It depends. That's not the value of this test. This test is not going to tell you you need to put out 50 pounds more nitrogen next year. That's not what this test does. This test simply tells you that in this year, if you were below 700, your plants ran out of nitrogen and you have to think about how you manage your nitrogen differently next year. That's all this test can do. All right, I want last slide before my conclusions, then I'm done. This was a survey of cornstalk nitrate tests in Delaware and Maryland. Little old data, I think I remember taking some of these cornstalk samples. 950 samples uh, per field, and this is just all of them kind of lined up with the concentration from those CSNT. Remember, 700 to 2,000 is our optimum range. All right, so let's break this out. We only had 27% of those samples that were in that optimum range. 50% were excessive. There were 50% of people that are putting more nitrogen out than they need. Back off, all right? But you're not gonna know that without getting the results of this test. And we still had almost a quarter of the folks that were below optimum, okay? So I'd love to see some of these folks, this quarter that below optimum, move into that optimum range, and some of these folks, oh my gosh, back off your nitrogen a little bit, all right? All right, so my final thoughts. Nitrogen recommendation, we talk about recommendations, what we're really talking about is nitrogen management, and it's a process, it's an active verb, okay? That recommendation that you get from the university that goes into your plan can be affected by a lot of um, unpredictable factors, all right? Your best plan is always gonna be to pair your nitrogen application with when the crop needs it, all right? Now, if that sounds scary, if maybe you're interested, but you're like, there's, this is a lot, there are tools available to help you, there are people available to help you, all right? See your county ag extension agents. Practice using these tools. Don't go out and do all of these in one year. Start small and get comfortable with using these tools and what these results give you, all right? Keep good records and use them to inform future management. My goal at some point is to get us to this adaptive management process, all right, where we can capture that experience that you all have in your head, collect some data, and use it 
to inform that recommendation and that starting point for our end management process. Okay? With that, I'm out of breath and I will gladly take any questions. <laughs> any questions for the call? I'll be here the rest of the day. If y'all want to come talk to me, come talk to me at some point. Yeah, sure. You showed the one slide where you had 50% of the field had excessive nitrogen. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wouldn't that be a little more dangerous? Well, this was from 2009 to 2011. This was from 2009 to, yeah, this is old data. This was not data that was collected last year. No, you're, good question, good question. Yep. All right, if there's anyone else, come see me. I'll be hanging around all day. Thank you all very much for having me. So Mark Saltenfuss is here from uh, Nagel Crop Insurance, so. Thank you. Or Nagel Grain, Nagel Farm Service, all, all, all yeah, the above. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. I just want to say hi to everybody and thank you, uh, all of you who, who dealt with us this year. Um, it was a tough year, both as a grower and as a grain operation. Uh, the handle was down. It was a, it was just a tough year. Um, we turned the turned the page on the calendar, and now we're looking forward to 2000. 19, uh, as a crop insurance agent, I just want to tell you that all my colleagues would tell you the same thing. Look at that crop insurance policy. Make sure it's set up in the same entity that you're selling your grain in. Make sure that if you're adding a new county or a new crop that that's all taken care of. Uh, it needs to be all tucked in by uh, March the 15th. And I want to talk about, uh, see, Nicole talked about the four R's. I want to talk about six P's. Okay, four things you can't do anything about, but you got to deal with precipitation, prices, politics, and pests. You have to you have to figure out how to deal with all that. Okay, part of your crop insurance policy is to mitigate the pain, how far down you can go, and then merging it with a grain marketing plan that gives you opportunities for profits. So those are the six P's. Remember that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. We have a new sponsor today. Um, Bill is here from Bloom. So, Bill, you want to come on up? Thanks for being a sponsor. We appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, so I'm uh, Bill Brower from DC Water. We have a Bloom biosolids product. Hopefully some of you folks have, have been starting to hear about it. Um, it's a new product on the market. Uh, it's a biosolids product out of, uh, I work, like I said, uh, DC Water, so from our uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, and so it's a good source of uh, organic matter if you want to build up your soil health. You're building up your soil health uh, with organic matter and some of the beneficial soil microbes that are, that are in our biosolids product. And then you're also getting good, nice, slow release uh, nitrogen and phosphorus from our product. So we're kind of new entrants. We're starting up our marketing efforts. Um, so we're very competitively priced. It's about four to six dollars uh, a ton delivered to this area. Um, so we're trying to be competitive with inorganic nitrogen, even though you get some more benefits from, from using our product, macronutrients, micronutrients, uh, some drought resistant properties, various things. And um, we'll often um, give folks a, a trial load. So if anybody's interested, I'll be out there. We'll give you a free trial load. You can try it out and we're, we're sure you'll like the results and uh, be coming back for more. So just come see us at the booth out there. Thanks. <laughs>